Uh, but my name is Benjamin Neal, and I'm a postdoctoral research uh, scholar from the University of Queensland. And I'm with the Coral Reef Ecology Lab, and that's what we study, coral reef ecology. And this project is called the Catlin Sea View Survey. And the main point of this project is to go around the world and look at the status of coral reefs uh, right now. So one of the things that we're really after in our project is to try to expand the, the size, the spatial scope that we're sampling coral reefs. And we have some special technology to be able to do that. I do want to say, though, that uh, myself and everyone else here have uh, just come off the boat. And by just come off the boat, I mean like today. Uh, we, we just got off about two hours ago. So if we seem a little rough or uh, a little bit uh, salty, that's because we've just been out for 21 days straight diving. Um, and uh, I think we're probably all decompressing a little bit from that right now. But the main uh, thing that I want to start with, uh, the main point to start with, is that coral reefs are at risk. About half of coral reefs around the world have already been damaged. And in places like the Caribbean, that figure rises to about 90%. So I think it's a little bit hard to imagine here in the Maldives. We've traveled all over the central Maldives in the last three weeks, and we've seen some fantastic coral reefs. But we've also traveled, we also did a portion of this project in the Caribbean, and on the Great Barrier Reef, and in a lot of other places in the Indo-Pacific. And the truth is, a lot of coral reefs look terrible. Um, so you're really blessed here, I think, in the Maldives to have remaining intact coral reefs. But one of the issues is, is that coral reefs might not remain that way um, forever, and it might not be local uh, stressors that cause that decline. There are global stressors from changing ocean acidity, the changing temperature of the surface of the ocean um, going up, and then also, uh, coral reefs everywhere are under stress from overfishing. When you remove fish from the ecosystem, um, it, it throws everything off and can lead basically to algal overgrowth. We didn't see much of that here, and I understand uh, one of the main reasons we didn't see much of that here, I think, is because I understand that parrotfish are banned for export. And uh, I just want to say I think that's probably a great policy, because we saw lots of big uh, parrotfish out there. And so that's something that we haven't seen in a lot of other places. Most notably, if I was to point fingers at someone, Indonesia. We saw no parrotfish, no sharks, and the reefs looked terrible. So that's my summary so far for what we've seen uh, you know, here in the Maldives. And I think you're to be congratulated for what, may, what, what must be good management to keep the reefs in that condition. One other issue with the way that reefs are changing now is that in a lot of cases, the speed of change is outpacing coral reef science. So, you know, people like myself and my colleagues here, we like to get out, we like to go diving, we publish papers. There's often a lag time that's involved in that of a year, two years, three years. I'm publishing a paper uh, hopefully next month based on observations we made in 2005 in Panama. And the remarkable thing about the pace of coral reef decline is that it's happening faster than a lot of coral reef science can even keep up. There are places around the world where coral reef ecosystems are essentially dying that have never been documented or perhaps never even really been seen. And so one of the big things we're looking for in our project is to try to speed up the science so that we're able to keep up, for, keep up with that. Um, there's a notable uh, quote here from someone, Charlie Barron, who wrote this book called The Reef in Time. But I should mention, Charlie Barron also wrote a book called Corals of the World which I think the title of that alone tells you what an expert he is at this, and he's single-handedly named about 20% of the world's corals. And he says that it's really not a great exaggeration to say we may be headed for the world's sixth great extinction. And unfortunately, marine ecosystems may sort of lead the charge in that. So we have three goals with the Kaplan Seaview Survey. The first one is to try to catalog present-day coral baselines worldwide. We go to different countries, We've been to about 17 countries so far, and uh, we do essentially the same type of survey in those places. And then the main aim is to be able to contrast and compare that across what's essentially one period of time. This has taken us about two years or two and a half years, but really what we're trying to do is lay down a baseline of what's the status of coral reefs around the world right now. The second big goal we're after is to improve the speed of coral reef science to match that pace of decline. Um, and that's what I was just talking about a second ago. And then the third really big goal that we have, I think which pertains to all of the countries we visit and the Maldives, is that we really want to share the information that we gather as, as clearly and cleanly and transparently as we can for maximum benefit. 
So I'm going to be talking today first about the technology that's involved in what we do. We have a, um, we do rapid panoramic high definition camera surveys. And that's one of the main things I'm going to talk about because that piece of technology underlies the, um, the work that we're doing. And then I'm going to give three examples of ecological app applications. The first one is classification of benthic habitats. In other words, what's on the bottom and how can we get that out of our camera system? The second one is bleaching detection and quantification. And this is important because coral bleaching is really one of the greatest causes of coral mortality around the world. And then the third one is monitoring specific disturbance events. And I'm going to give a really specific example, which is a shipwreck, a ship strike. Um, but it's actually quite a small area that I'm talking about in that disturbance, but you can extrapolate that out uh, to mean uh, harbor dredging or resort development or whatever those point uh, types of disturbances are. So the first thing is to have a look at our camera. This is our camera right here. It's about two meters long, weighs about 60 kilograms, and it's um, self-propelled. There's a propeller right back there that drives it through the water. And what this creates is it creates panoramic high-definition images that I think we've all become used to with Google Street View, where you can, you know, just like in Google Street View, you can go somewhere, you can look at somebody's door, you can look and see what's on the other side of the street, you can look up, you can look down. That's the same thing you do when you're diving. And that's what we're after, is we're trying to really recreate virtual dives to take people underwater. I've heard that only one out of a thousand people, I think it's probably higher in this room, but only one out of a thousand people around the world ever gets to go underwater and go diving. And so we're trying to develop a product that can bring the underwater world to the 99.9% .9 of people that might not otherwise get to see these remarkable ecosystems. Inside this housing on the end, we have three Canon 5D Mark II cameras firing simultaneously. So we're creating an 80 megapixel image every three seconds as we, as we uh, drive through the water. And from this, we patch together that panoramic image that I was talking about. And what comes out of it are images that are really very similar to uh, Google Street View. And I just wanted to have a quick look at some of those. Um, let me just pop out of here really quickly. And go ahead and fire pop, sorry. Let's just have a quick look. So this is our partner called Underwater Earth. And they have a number of, um, of what they call virtual dives, which are a single image that we take. We take one of these images every three seconds. Um, and here's an example. You can look around. There's your buddy right there, just where they should be, right behind you. And you can look down on the bottom. You can see what's going on. You can have a panorama, pan around, look at fish. Well, here comes a big one. Um, and here's a big potato pod that was remarkably close to the camera, actually. Um, but you can see that this is really the kind of thing that uh, allows you to have a good look and feel for what it looks like underwater. There we go, about 10 meters down, more fish up there, looking back down. So what I'm really interested in, though, is not just in this type of product, although I will say that this type of product is, has been really remarkable for outreach and education, for taking people underwater and giving them that feel. But what I'm personally most interested in as a scientist is what you see down here when you look down. I'm interested in how much coral can you see on the bottom? How much sand can you see on the bottom? How much dead coral do you see on the bottom? How much algae? So benthic classification is really what I'm most after in looking at these images. Returning to the slideshow, let's just have a quick look at the camera itself. Um, this is a schematic of it. And there's a couple of interesting things on here, I think. The first one is the camera housing up here. We have three uh, dome ports on there, which take in light from 190 degrees. So the dome port, if it's looking down, is actually taking in light that's higher than that dome port and bending it right into the, uh, right into the lens. And it's that panoramic sense that we patch together to create that, that, full, um, that full bubble that surrounds you. Um, down here we have something interesting, which is the altitude sensor. When you're taking pictures underwater, of course, you can't really maintain an even distance off the bottom. And one of the difficulties for what we do is we want to know how far we are off. Because, for example, I'm looking at a panel right here on the ground, but if I was farther away, that panel would look smaller. And in terms of the benthic science, it's really important to get that right. And so we have an altitude sensor here that senses the altitude off the bottom 10 times a second, matches that to the picture, and then adjusts the size of the picture so that we're able to get the same size, um, the same piece of bottom in terms of size each time. So this is really a lot like traditional coral reef science, where you go diving and you might put down a plastic, uh, a plastic square, a transect on the bottom, and you might measure what's inside of it. 
what we can do is measure that same accurately sized portion of the bottom while moving over it about a thousand times per dive instead of about 50 or 100 times per dive that you could do if you were just diving. We have a computer right back here that uh, drives the whole unit. We have a little custom made app on there so that we can change the ISO of the cameras. We can turn the cameras on and off. We can basically control everything that's up in here from back here. And then this section right here of the, uh, of the um, whole system is really just the propulsion unit. And that allows us to go about two kilometers underwater per dive. So we drop down, we get the unit set up, and then we start shooting images, and we can cover about two kilometers. And this is also really important because when, uh, as anybody here who dives knows, that when you drop in at one spot, it might be quite different five feet away. It might be really different 100 meters away. You know, and, it's, and it might be, again, totally different uh, 500 meters away. And so we're trying to transition through those interesting ecological zones and get continuous data across them. I mentioned that the uh, images can be really powerful for outreach and education. And here's a really good one that we, uh, that we have. And uh, this, this image right here was actually featured recently in Time Magazine, um, Time Magazine International Edition, which is a great outreach. Supposedly, I don't know if I believe these kind of statistics myself, but supposedly the outreach uh, for this project has reached a billion people worldwide. I'm not sure if that just means the number of times someone has clicked it, but it certainly is a lot. So uh, one of the things that our, um, our project says now is that it appears that our online, how do they say this, it appears that our online um, outreach has reached more people than have ever been diving in the history of diving. Um, I'm not sure if that's true, but I do know it's a good thing. That's really what we're trying to do, is to get the message of marine ecology out to as many people as we can. So as I said, I'm going to talk about three specific science applications now. And for the most part, this is looking down, which is really the view that I said I was most interested in. And the first one is how to classify habitats. And again, part of the reason we want to do this is because we really want to know what's on the bottom. And not just coral or algae or sand, but what kind of coral and what size of coral and how much habitat does that coral create. So we look at the morphological type of the coral, branching, mounding, uh, massive types, things like that. And you can see they're quite different. This to this to this. And then you'll have dead space in the middle. You have algae down there as well, crustose coral and algae. We have about, at most, probably 80 to 100 categories that we can possibly put for what's on the bottom. And, uh, and it's the makeup of those categories that really define what kind of, uh, what kind of coral reef it is. And again, I said that the way we do this is we standardize that to one meter by one meter quadrats, which are taken every three seconds as we move across the bottom. We have another system that we've developed as part of this project, which really enables, um, enables this work, because as anyone who's ever done photographically based underwater work knows, it's really fun and it's really easy to get lots of pictures. In, in a few dives, you can get enough pictures to really keep you busy for about a month in terms of processing. Um, and so it's a real issue if we take a thousand uh, images per dive and we do that three times a day, you know, where are we going to find 500 graduate students to process all of these images simultaneously? Well, of course you can't. And so the second part of what we're doing is we've developed a computer vision system that analyzes coral reef habitat automatically. This is called point annotation right here. And you can see, for example, this point is sort of moundy like this and brown. And you can see that this point is more purplish and has a finer uh, pattern to it. And just as we can see that, computers can also see that. And so what we've developed is this automated point identification system where what you do is you get all of your images and you go through and you name what the points are. And you do that for some time. You might have to do 5,000 or 8,000 points, which isn't as hard as it seems. But then the computer begins to learn from the points that you've annotated and the structure of those points and begins to answer what the other points are. So at that point, it's sort of like rolling downhill. It just all speeds up, and you can analyze all of your images automatically. And what we can do from that when we're able to sense, when we're able to take a lot more images and sense what the habitat is over a wider area, is you can begin to get a sense of looking at habitat types, uh, defining like an entire atoll, or from atoll to atoll. And you can really begin to look at uh, landscape level ecology instead of point-based ecology. And that's what we're after. Eventually moving from single observations like this, I'm sorry this slide doesn't come across as well as it could up on that screen, moving from single observations up to like the edge of an atoll, 
up to the edge of an island like this, and then even defining a whole region or a whole portion of a country, that's Australia, which is barely visible, or eventually we'll be able to define you know, what the coral reefs really look like on a, on a worldwide basis or a regional basis. And then again, what we can do from this is we'll be able to pick out the areas of the planet that are being the most impacted. And I'm sure that most people in this room know this who go diving, but when you do one or two dives or 100 dives or even 500 dives, you can't really say all the time exactly what you're going to see. And that's one thing I've learned on this project is oftentimes when we're on the boat, I actually think I have no idea what's down there. And what we're trying to do is we're basically trying to get enough images to where you can really say this is what this area is defined by. This place might be different, this might be different, this might be different, this might be different, but as a whole, are coral reefs in the Maldives healthy? Are they healthier than coral reefs in the Philippines? Those are the type of large-scale questions that we're trying to answer. The second thing we can do is, uh, on a much smaller scale, we can use this uh, imagery and this type of automatic analysis to look at things like bleaching. And coral bleaching um, happens, these are bleached corals right here, Coral bleaching happens when the coral animal, which lives on the hard coral skeleton, expels the zooxanthellae, the single-celled algae that live inside of it. And corals need these single-celled algae that live inside of them. It's an obligate symbiosis that has to take place. So when corals are stressed by temperature, which is the most common thing, and of course temperature stress is increasing due to global change, when they're stressed by temperature, they have to get rid of those algae. And it's an extremely stressful event for the corals. Depending on the genera that you're talking about, there can be up to 100% or 50% mortality of those particular species. And I think uh, here in the Maldives, um, probably a lot of you remember the, the big bleaching event that happened in 1998, when coral cover went from you know, somewhere around 50% in a lot of places, basically to 1 or 2% across the entire archipelago. And a lot of that was the result of, of wide-scale bleaching like you see here. And what we've done is we've taken our automated system to be able to detect color, and we can drive across the habitat, and we can sense how much bleaching is going on. And uh, this is just from a, just basically from a lab or a, um, from a uh, proof of concept study. But we can see over here that basically we got a lot closer to the real value using our camera system than we got doing belt transects. And a belt transect is really just what it sounds like. You go down to the bottom, you lay out a long string, you go along it and you measure stuff along that string. It's sort of traditional coral reef science. But the problem is, is that you can undersample a lot of things using belt transects and other underwater methods. And we're hoping that the technology that we're using might be able to overcome part of that. The third thing I want to talk about is monitoring things like point disturbances. And the example I want to use is of a warship that ran aground in the Philippines. This is the USS Guardian. Um, it went aground on the 17th of January, 2013. Uh, due to kind of a remarkable navigation error. And I say remarkable because there was nothing in every direction from this coral atoll for about 175 miles. So how they managed to find the one piece of rock to run into and smack their warship on it, I'm not exactly certain of. But it was so bad that they had to, dis they had to dismantle the vessel in place and lift it off with a giant crane. So kind of, a, kind of a big disaster, actually. And also, it's an interesting case to look at because as you can imagine, when you run a warship onto a coral reef, you pretty much smash everything in there. And uh, so we went to this site with our camera and uh, drove back and forth over it a number of times and uh, wanted to have a look. Before I talk about what we found out with our camera, though, I just want to say that this particular picture right here was taken by our local partners who worked with in the Philippines. And they have this great system where they put the GoPro on a kite. And they fly the kite up above the site. And they get these fabulous aerial images using uh, you know, a system that costs about, um, probably costs about $400 for the camera and about 50 bucks for the kite uh, is about all. So I'm really impressed by that, actually, as a, as a piece of cost-effective technology. And you can see the kite deployment team and the kite string right there going up to the camera. So they got this great image. And that's actually the ghost of the, uh, of the warship right there, where it's smashed in and then kind of moved in along the reef up towards the shallow portion. So we went there and took some pictures, and this is one of the, a cut from one of the type of panoramic photos that we get. And this is immediately before the, the wreck site. In fact, you can see just a little bit of it starting there, and that's what the wreck site looks like when you, when you go over it. So nearly complete elimination of the corals in that area. And this isn't actually so strange. I mean, warships don't run aground all the time, but certainly there's a lot of other types of impact, including 
um, including land reclamation activities that are going on here and other types of impacts on the coral reef. So these really localized impacts can take many forms. We just happened to choose this one from the shipwreck. So we found out a couple of interesting things. We um, drove the camera back and forth, as I said, over it. We processed the images. And one thing that came out right up here is that hard coral up current of the, of the wreck site was about 40%. And then on the wreck site, the hard coral was about 0% or 1%. That's really not that surprising. As I just showed you, it smashed it right on down. However, the interesting thing is that down current of that area, an area which had no direct impacts, the coral cover was cut in half. So it's 20% here, and it's 40% up here. And you can see the bare rock space increased considerably, but the bare rock space hasn't increased in the down, in the down current side because it wasn't actually physically disturbed. But what's happening here is that that silt is washing off of that wreck site, and those coral chunks are washing down by the current from that wreck site. And you're essentially getting a secondary disturbance that's about three times larger than the place of, of initial disturbance. And so the real point that I want to make here is when you can do long transects, long photographic transects, you can pick up these kind of subtle effects that actually can have a pretty significant, significant impact on the health of that whole ecosystem. So that was kind of interesting. The other thing we noted was that down current, there's a lot more algae coming in. And again, even though there hasn't been direct impact to the coral down there, the disturbance is enough to allow that algae to begin to take over that, uh, that particular patch of coral ecosystem. I mentioned as well that one of our goals is to try to share everything we have. Um, and we've started this site here called the Global Reef Record. And we're putting every picture on there and every derivation of the picture. Um, which, which, which is to say we process our images to pull different, uh, different types of products out of them. All of those images will be available on here and all of the data that we get out of this as well for each of the countries we visit. So hopefully this is the kind of, of web resource that can be used by undergraduates or graduate students who have an interest in a particular area to look up when we surveyed there, to go back and survey on that exact location because we have GPS points for every image as well. So we're really hoping that this can begin to be a repository for other people to use. The second thing that I want to say, um, there's a quote here from Jeremy Jackson. Um, what is needed is a central repository for coral reef data. And this isn't, like, this isn't really as sort of academic a point as you might think it is. The real point here is, is that all of us, those of us who live in Australia, those of us who live you know, in Hawaii, those of you who live here in the Maldives, everyone is being affected by global forces that are affecting coral reefs now. We don't really need to get a central repository for coral reef data. What we need is for all of us to wrap our heads around the idea that this is a global issue and we need to cooperate, we need to bring all of our data together to understand it. Because again, that change is taking place faster and on a bigger scale than we may even realize. So um, we're lucky to have our, uh, our graduate students here today uh, from the cruise. And each of them is going to get up now and speak. Um, and uh, Dom is first, Dominic Bryant, right here.